Amen. Amen. We praise God on tonight, on this beginning of revival. I'm sure our Pastor Keisha already told you that our revivalist for this evening has some challenges, but he will be here next Tuesday. The Reverend Dr. John Faison of the Watson Grove Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, will be here on the 23rd. And then the following Tuesday will be our, another good friend of ours, the Reverend Dr. Charles Goodman of the Tabernacle Baptist Church of Augusta, Georgia. But we did not want to cancel tonight. And so here I am. Hopefully you're not tired of hearing me, but I stepped in tonight in this revival season and we thank God. And I'm grateful for all of you on tonight who are joining and who have stayed to watch and participate. So now instead of two weeks of revival, we have three weeks of revival. And so for that, I am truly grateful and thankful for all of those who made this night possible. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that worship experience. It was a throwback worship experience from when we were in the building. I know, like many of you, I miss being in this building. Uh, but I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was asked by some leadership, how long did I think before we got back? And I said anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And, and it's still holding fast. We have to be safe more than anything else and make sure that we are taking every precaution to keep those who are part of this family and those who enter these uh, doors safe. But again, we thank God for revival on tonight. Now, trust me, beloved, I'm going to be short tonight. I will not be long, but again, just thankful for all of you who have joined in on tonight. So I want to turn very quickly in this revival season because the truth is we need a revival. We need this revival. We had to cancel it last year in March because of the pandemic, and I was determined to have it this year, and I'm grateful that the two revivalists are willing to come here and preach versus virtually sending in the sermon. I'm looking forward to hearing them in this building preaching over the next two weeks, but we were determined because if there was ever a season, if there was ever a season and a time where we needed to be revived, is this season. It has been challenging. It has been difficult. But we all have experienced the presence, the power, and the provision of God. And in this season, we are utterly grateful. Utterly, utterly grateful. So if you will, if you're home, you could join me. Let's, we, you, you, you're in the building, but you're not in the building. So stand with me where you are. We're going to read the scripture on tonight found in the book of Joshua. It's a scripture that I, I've looked to in the past, but on my way to the building this evening, when I realized I would have to preach, uh, this scripture for some reason came to mind. And I feel like it's appropriate um, given this season and our need to be revived. And so Joshua, the eighth chapter, verses 13 and 14. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. And here's how it reads, Joshua 8, 13 and 14. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city, and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. Matter of fact, family, let me give more context. Let me read verse 12 through 14. Taking about 5,000 men, he set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. I'll actually stop there and just look at verses 12 and 13 on tonight. Come on, let's pray, beloved. God, we thank you and we honor you on tonight. We are so grateful, oh God, that you continue to give us reasons daily to rejoice. In this season, you've, oh God, shown yourself to be faithful in so many ways. And You've made your presence known in so many ways. And for that, we are truly, truly grateful. So God, on tonight, there's some watching, oh God, who are looking through blurry eyes, oh God. 
sometimes because of the tears and the weight of this season. Oh, God, it's not just about the pandemic. Life has been challenging in this season. So even on tonight, oh, God, we pray that you would lead us into a space where we can receive the word that you have for us on tonight. For at the end of the day, oh God, this is really your revival. And we stand in need of a word to revive our weary souls on tonight. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for this reminder, this beautiful reminder that you have not left us, that you have not forsaken us, that you were there all the time. We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. And we say amen. Amen, family. I want to make that correction. Let's look at tonight again, Joshua 8, verses 12 and 13. Joshua 8, verses 12 and 13. Taking about 5,000 men, he set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. I'm going to read that last line again. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. Amen. This evening, I want to speak from the subject, breakthrough at the scene of the breaking. Breakthrough at the scene of the breaking. I can only imagine how Joshua must have felt that night camped in the valley. The record says that he was stationed with 5,000 of his men between Bethel and Ai. Bethel means house of God. Ai means place of ruin. There, Joshua, in the valley between God's space and a ruined place. And there in that moment, He's preparing for his second battle against the people of Ai. When you read these two verses, it might seem harmless at first, but there is a larger context to frame this valley moment for Joshua. For he is preparing for this second battle with the people of Ai, having lost the first battle. Joshua sits there getting ready to fight for the second time with the pain of loss the first time around. That first time of defeat was overwhelming for Joshua, the leader of God's people. You see, they had already defeated the people at Jericho and were on their way to taking over fully the land of Canaan. It was the promise from God. The scripture says that when they prepared to move forward after the victory at Jericho, they were then getting ready to fight the people of Ai. They were full with a lot of belief and strength and power because they could not have imagined that their victory against Jericho would come in such an unorthodox manner. If you remember the story, they defeated the city by marching around the city gates making a loud noise, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. They were filled with confidence and courage in God. But as they got ready to fight the next battle at Ai, the scripture says that 
filled with courage and confidence, the leaders of Israel's army told Joshua, we don't need to send a lot of people to Ai. They are a small town, a small village, and so only a couple of thousand may be necessary. And the scripture says that when they got to Ai, those few thousand men, that they not only lost, but many of the men were killed in the battle. And Israel, after having defeated Jericho, a mighty fortified city, lost the battle to a lesser foe, the people of Ai. Joshua internalized the defeat in his mind. How could this be? How could we have lost the battle? This record says that when the people came back, reported this defeat after the large victory at Jericho, that Joshua tore his clothes and sat in a state of mourning. And in his mind, how could they have lost? And he did what many of us do when we face a mighty unexpected defeat after a great victory. He began to question, maybe we should never have crossed the Jordan in the first place. Maybe we should never have gone into this land. Maybe we should have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. I hope you can hear this tonight. In the face of a, of a defeat, after a great victory, Joshua is ready to go back to the place where he was before God guided them across the Jordan. Oh, my God. How, how many times along your life, in the face of a defeat, you forgot past victory, that you were ready to forfeit everything that you had gained, everything you had learned, everything that God had done, just because you did not expect a defeat. And sometimes there's nothing worse than an unexpected defeat, especially when you face the enemy filled with courage and confidence from the last victory. And so he now enters this face where he now is in a state of mourning. Mourning a current loss while forgetting a past victory. And he sits there in his ash heap with his torn clothes in a state of mourning and cries out to God, why did you even bring us here? This is no place of promise. This is now a place of pain. As if promised places don't have pain sometimes. Oh, I hope you can hear that this, uh, this evening. Sometimes we hear a word from God and we hear God speaking to us and we know what God has said. And then the path that we think we're following that God has ordained, we meet a stumbling block. We meet a challenge. We meet an obstacle. And all of a sudden, we begin to question whether or not it was God we really heard or whether or not we were really doing what God told us to do or whether or not we really were trusting God the way we ought to because we get confused because we thought that somehow God's presence meant no pain. And here... Joshua is coming face to face with the reality that yes, you are chosen. And yes, Joshua, you are the leader. And yes, this is the land of promise. But don't think you won't go through some things sometimes. This faith we have does not make us immune to the ambiguities and inconsistencies of life. This faith that we have doesn't mean we have some secret force field or protection against life's tragedies. No. It means that in the face of ambiguity and tragedy and pain and hardship, we know how to tap into another source and another power. God tells Joshua, get up. Get up from your mourning. Stop having a pity party. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. I know it's rough and I know you didn't expect this, but life is like this sometimes. Sometimes it will be days of woe and days of mourning and days of tears, but those days don't define your lifetime. Yeah. He reminds Joshua, and he tells him, and I, and I won't be long, but he says to Joshua, he said, you, you got a problem. You have, Joshua, a, a connection problem. What do you mean? There's somebody you connected to who don't trust me. Oh, I hope you can hear this tonight. He, he says, your problem is a connection problem. You see, when they won the battle of Jericho, they were told to take nothing from Jericho, no spoils, no sacred things from Jericho. And, and, and that was because why would you need to steal when God provides? Oh, I hope you can hear this on this evening. They were to take nothing with them out of Jericho. And yet, and yet God said, somebody in your camp, somebody who you're connected to, 
has taken stuff that they did not need to take because maybe they didn't trust that I will provide. So Joshua must then go through the camp and he finds that it is in this particular family clan that Achan is the culprit. And he asks Achan, why did you do this? He said, he said, when I saw the beautiful mantle and the gold bars worth 50 shekels, I couldn't resist. Oh, when I saw the shiny things, I couldn't just let them pass by. The shiny things caught my eye and I could not put my trust in a God who sometimes moves through clouds and not the shiny things. Oh, I hope you can hear this on tonight. And Joshua tells Achan, what have you done? Your one action has had communal repercussions. Your lack of trust has had consequences beyond your greed. Your inability to get past your own blinding eyes, blinded by the glitter and the glamour, has now caused dire consequences for us. Aiken, you have held us back. And I know, beloved, we don't like to hear this, but what happens next is something that is put in the story, I convinced, as a reminder. It says that the people under Joshua's direction stoned Achan to death. Joshua had to cut the connection with the people and the person who did not trust. Maybe, 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 and not all the time, but maybe some of the defeats we experience is because we got some bad connections. Maybe, 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 maybe there's some people in our lives. And I'm not suggesting that they be stoned, but maybe just cut off. I know we don't like to think about that, but I've learned in my life that there's some spaces that become difficult to inhabit because my weight is too heavy. Not heavy from me, but carrying the burdens and the problems and the baggage of people who are not meant to take this journey with me. How many times in your life have you found yourself falling short, missing out, falling back? Because you connected to the wrong people. Oh, I know that it's painful to hear. But sometimes the issue is a connection problem. And you got to be honest enough to say, yeah, I've, I've, I've done an inventory of my life. I've done a spiritual and emotional inventory. And I found that there's just too much weight in my life. And that means there's some things I got to cut off. God told Joshua, you can't move forward. Until you get rid of not the dead weight, but the disobedient weight. Achan is gone. Joshua is still in grief. And then God says the one thing that I know Joshua was not ready to hear. And that is go back to Ai. Yes, Joshua, go back with the taste of defeat still in your mouth. With the torn clothes as a symbol of your mourning still on your body. With the ashes still dusty on your countenance. Go back to the place of your last defeat. Oh, my God. I hope somebody can hear that tonight. Can you imagine when God tells you to go back to the place where you were broken. It may not be something we hear from God all the time, but there may be times when God pushes us back to the broken places, not to reminisce over our weakness, but to discover our strength. In in the words of Ernest Hemingway, maybe sometimes God pushes us back to the broken places 
to find out that we're strong in the broken places. Maybe, 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 maybe there's something to the revisiting of wounded spaces. And maybe if we get past the damage, we can see the destiny connected to our strength. He tells Joshua, go back. And Joshua goes back. But this time, it's a little different. He goes back this time for the fight a little lighter. Because sometimes we realize that what prepares us for the next fight is having to what? Lessen the load from the past defeat. And so he comes back a little lighter, but he comes back again another reality. Here's the reality you need to hear tonight, beloved. And if you get nothing else tonight, get this one reality. That oftentimes, never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. Those are not my words. Those are the words of F. Scott Fitzgerald, who said, never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. The one defeat does not become definitive. And it does not mean you cannot bounce back from the place of your prior defeat. And I hope someone can hear this tonight, who's still feeling bad about where you were broken, who's still feeling damaged about that breaking space, who's still feeling wounded about the breaking space. You have no need to hang your head down low. You have no need to feel sorry for yourself. You are stronger than you were the last time you you are there and you'll be able to come through with your strength and not your weakness. It just may be that your breakthrough will be in the place of your breaking. Can you imagine when God tells you to go back to the scene of the damage, to the scene of the wound, to the scene of the pain, but knowing the you who goes back to that scene is not the you who left the last time. That this time you come back a stronger person, a more courageous person, but also a lighter person and someone who understands that God has not left me at all in any time in my life. And that's why you can go back to those places with a new countenance and a new resolve and a new spirit. Because although the place ain't changed, you have changed. And that becomes the glory. Why can you go back? How can you go back to the scene of the breaking? How can you be sure that you'll get a breakthrough? Why? Because here's what you must tell yourself. Every now and again, when you feel overwhelmed by past defeats and you feel that you can no longer move forward into future glory or breakthrough, remind yourself, my past has not defined me, destroyed me, deterred me, or defeated me. It has only strengthened me. Oh, I'm going to say it one more time. My past has not deterred me, defined me, destroyed me, or defeated me. It has only strengthened me. I'll say it another way. My past has not defined me, destroyed me, deterred me, or defeated me. It has only strengthened me. Oh, you got to get this at home. My past has not defined me, destroyed me, deterred me, or defeated me. It has only strengthened me. That means every moment of challenge made me stronger. Every opposition made me stronger. All the challenges made me stronger. The enemies made me stronger. The battles made me stronger. The pandemic made me stronger. My wounds made me stronger. My damage made me stronger. My pain made me stronger. And I hope there's somebody watching tonight who can testify right there in your house. You might want to have a party right there in your house right now when you can look back over all the things you've gone through and all the past hurts and past pain and past defeats and say that these things have not defined me. They've just made me stronger. Stronger. And every now and again, here's one of the real secrets I've learned. Some defeats can't come until you have a few, lo or rather, some victories can't come until you've had a few losses. Oh, you missed this, beloved. My losses made my celebration in the victory that much more better. Because it's only when you felt the bitterness of defeat can you feel the thoroughness of the celebration in the place of victory. Oh, you can have breakthrough at the scene of your breaking because some losses, losses propelled you to an unforeseen future. Can I give you this and I'm done? There in that valley, while Joshua is preparing for the fight. If 
you read that story, God uses the arrogance of the victors last time to bring about their defeat this time. He sets a trap for the people of Ai. Just a few thousand men run towards Ai. And when Ai sees them coming again, they make the assumption this is all. They had no idea that when they ran out to meet and the people of Israel started running, they thought they were chasing them away. And all they were doing was setting themselves up to be flanked on the rear side. I hope you can hear this. There will be moments in your life when your enemy doesn't see your rear flank. They don't know that God is covering, that God is protecting. Isn't it amazing when you can stand in the face of the enemy and they don't understand why you're unmoved, why you're undeterred? It's because their back is to your blessing. Oh, you missed that. Joshua, the men looked at Ai coming. The people of Ai had no idea that they were more on the backside of their arrogance. And they lost that day. And Joshua and the men got the victory. Can I put it to you this way? You got to remember, beloved, that sometimes you got more for you than you have against you. Many years ago, I shared a story here, and I close with this tonight. Somebody needs to hear this. A friend of mine told me a story about a, a young boy who, who had cancer and had to have his left arm amputated. And he was depressed, and you can imagine being a young boy and, and lose your arm. He went through a bad phase where he felt unworthy and insecure and, and not himself. One day they were coming from the grocery store. His mother saw on the wall there that there were signs for a judo class. And she thought maybe, maybe if I get him into something like this, it'll build his confidence back up. And so they went to the judo school and the teacher saw him and the teacher was not deterred. I mean, judo is about flips and throws and grappling. This young man only had one arm. He lost his left arm. And he started training with the teacher, and the teacher said, I'm going to show you something. And he showed him one move for months, over and over and over again, for months, for months, for months. One move. Then out of nowhere, the teacher said one day, he said, I want to enter you into a tournament. He said, a tournament? He said, I only know one move. He said, no, no. He said, what I've been training you in the past several months has been the hardest move in judo. He said, and in a short period, you may not have seen it, but you, you mastered it. He said, but I still only have one arm. He said, no, no. He said, because the only way to counter this move is for your opponent to grab your left arm. I hope you get that tonight. He went on to win the tournament, became the champion, got the victory, not knowing that the key to his victory was his loss. Oh, you're closer than you can imagine tonight. I know there are moments where you feel defeated and unworthy, broken and in pain. And you want to quit and you don't want to go back and you don't want to fight no more. You don't want to push anymore. You don't want to work any harder. This has been a rough year. And we've suffered many losses. We are not defined by those losses. We're closer to our breakthroughs than we could imagine. Let me just be clear. You've been winning. You've been winning. Yeah. And maybe sometimes we just need a little reminder that we got more wins than losses. When you got more wins than losses, the losses don't mean 
as much when you're still victorious. Maybe life is coming to the realization that in this journey, you'll have more wins than losses. And maybe in the face of past defeats, you keep on moving through and you win and then you lose sometimes. You win and you win and you win and maybe you lose. You win and you win and you win and you win and maybe you lose. And when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, you then realize with all your wins and some losses, maybe, maybe this is what it means to be more than a conqueror. Oh. Your breakthrough just might be at the scene of your breaking. Come on, beloved. Let's pray. God, we thank you on tonight. We honor you, O oh God, for this time, this season. God, if we're honest, there are many of us who feel the weight of 12 months filled with anxiety and fear and loss and death. Loved ones we've lost, jobs we've lost, people have lost places they've lived in, loss upon loss upon loss. But maybe, oh God, these spaces, these wounded, fragile spaces, somehow, somehow, get turned into fertile soil for seasons of growth and breakthrough. God, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. May we always walk with the deep reminder that you're still moving, God. You're still moving. Your power is still flowing. Your love is never ending. Your strength is still providing. And that knowledge is what enables us to withstand times of challenge and pain. Because we know that you can transform broken places into breakthrough spaces. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. And we say, amen. 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 Beloved, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. I know it was unexpected. We expected to see Reverend Dr. John Faison, but he will be here next Tuesday. I hope you tune in to watch on the 23rd, our good friend, Reverend Dr. John Faison of the Watson Grove Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And then on the 30th, again, our really good friend, they're both coming back again, Reverend Dr. Charles Goodman of the Tabernacle Baptist Church of Augusta, Georgia. This is revival season. And so I'm grateful. We are grateful that you join us tonight. Spread the word. Let three people know for next week. We used to do this and call it the Trinity Challenge. Tell three people between now and next Tuesday about our revival and they don't want to miss hearing our good friend, Reverend Dr. John Faison. Family, until we meet again, the three things we always have to do, you know what those are. We live, we love, we serve. Until next time, peace and blessings.